I will attempt to read the eight verses. Let it be as bold as possible. There are two labels that I have been instructed to bring. My principal labor for tonight is titled God's Model for Surrender. And I perceive that there is no greater time in which we can bring emphasis to Jesus' shape in modeling a life of surrender. The whole Easter narrative is built around the advertisement of him who in totality submitted to the will of God. That's what the whole Easter thing is about. It was not God manipulating a man. It was a man in willingness aligning with the received counsel of God. Maybe I should also add quickly that the Easter narrative was not designed to be an end. The cyclic memorials that we build every year are designed to lure many more into existing in the shape of the Christ. That in submission to the will of the Father, you will be allowed to partake of his kind of death. So that you will also come into the experience of his kind of resurrection. And it's at that point that you become a gift of God to your world. Maybe you need a verse of scripture to explain what I just said. So you give me Philippians chapter 3 and give me the 10th verse. Philippians chapter 3, the 10th verse. Paul was in petition posture. He was gifted a privilege in prayers within the framework of his discourse. And um, for me, it, it's advantageous because one of the reasons why I perceive the modern day expression of the church has not been able to replicate the ancient apostolic dimensions is because we pray differently. Our prayers as a man's prayers, let me put it that way, are essentially a revelation of his perception of God. I'm saying that the, the things you ask God for are built on who you think that God is. The things you have not bothered to ask him for that are yours in him advertise not just the ignorance of what is yours but the ignorance of who he is. Is somebody with me? If I understand that God can give a house it means he's a house giver. I will approach him for a house. But when death knocks my door, if I do not understand that the house giver is also a life giver, I will not ask him for life. So our asking is built on knowledge. And if there's anything you want to get in this season, please go after the knowledge of God. When you pick up scriptures, let your labor be to find the God of the Bible. That's the tool, our uh, weapon in these last days. A God not only known, but a God possessed. That's our tool for prevailing in the last days. A God not only known, but also a God possessed. All right. So Paul said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. There was a kind of resurrection that Jesus had that was different from the resurrection of Lazarus. The resurrection of Lazarus was from death unto life unto death. Because if you approach unto Bethany now in Israel, you will likely find out in semi-deified form um, the tombstone of Lazarus. There's a possibility that a hut may have been built upon it. Because if you taste death and you come back, 
and there's a possibility of deifying you. I mean, attributing some godness to you. But you see, the kind of resurrection that Jesus experienced came with an immunity against the strength of death. He resurrected unto the full experience of immortality. So that if we congregate all of the energies of death, when they meet him, they, death will walk away. There will be no contest. Because by his kind of resurrection, Jesus had been excluded from the strength of death. So Paul was not yearning for the experience of waking up when he's left for dead because he experienced that. He wanted to come into the, uh, the experience of total communion. I have shared in your wisdom. I have shared in your power. I also want to partake of your unique kind of resurrection. It could mean that Paul was speaking of the afterlife, that I want to resurrect unto life, but it could also mean that Paul understood and you'll find out out in Romans chapter 6. I want to invite you to study it because my plan was to read all of Romans 6 to make you understand from the lips of Paul as by the Holy Ghost this relationship between death and sin and the kind of life unto which we have been called maybe I'll do a little bit of the read Paul understood that the way death marks people according to scriptures is by sin are you with me it was sin that opened the gate unto And in case you have been lending your ears to that which traffics on the media, that some things are sinful and some things are not sinful, the basic definition of sin is something that falls short of the standards of God. Are you with me? I know some of you know what I'm talking about. It's not a year of fighting for me, but I owe you the responsibility that you should be careful how you hear because even trying to create a personal ground of safety, personal, we can no longer bring witness to scriptures. And what we do is to draw a list of ranking men in the kingdom who at a time in their life passed through an event and we now end it with, so with all that God is doing with that person, is that person a sinner? It means we are trying to remove the goalpost from where it is to carry it to another place. That if a ranking man in God does something wrong because of his rank, is no longer a sin. The average person does not understand the subtlety of the spirit of error. Remember, I warned you that this year you will hear errors like I've never heard before, and it's like the mouth of the serpent is open and he's spewing it out with impunity. That's why God must raise defenders. Now it's, it's just a burden. That's not the labor for tonight. We must consciously, in the place of the prophetic, comfort an army of defenders who will embody the word of God and will be able to speak with boldness, even if it means that they will miss out on privileges. It's a dark day that many who have held the banner of truth have lowered it and advancing counsels that will ruin a generation. Can I say to you, especially those who do, who are bi not bipolar, who are, what, what's that word now? Who are bilocational in influence? You know, some of us are just church, right? And so let me speak to people like Bolu. You are bilocational in influence. People like Glory. You are bilocational in influence. And there are many of you that I don't even know. People like Timmy, right? You are bilocational too. It means you have kingdom influence. I met Timias. Just the sister's squad. That's in Futa. That's how we met a few years ago. So, who was your president? Self? I'm sorry. Good. So, some of you are bilocational. What happened? Is it me? In influence. Don't lower standards. And be careful because 
Sometimes Babylon invites so that they can take your voice. Are you with me? So there are certain invitations outside the economy of the kingdom that will make you feel, yes, it's an opportunity to take kingdom influence there. Some of those grounds are slippery grounds. And in trying to take kingdom influence there, you may have to, you know, be very economical with the standards of the kingdom because of cravings for acceptability. Babylon does not govern by force. It governs by corruption. You may have to stand for something that you normally will not stand for or propound a theory that is against your belief system. You may be using the energies of Zion to advance Babylon. So every time you have an invitation from Babylon, sit with the Holy Ghost and capture what I call the wisdom of Daniel. The wisdom of Daniel has to do with um, influence in Babylon, but within the boundaries of kingdom consecration. Are you with me? I'm going to preach a sermon in a few weeks. I shared with my wife. I titled it. I'm going to speak a little bit about it if I get there tonight. I shared with my wife. I called it wisdom metaphors. Because the Lord said to me that the Bible is wide. And the average person who needs to be wise to beat the enemy may not have the privilege to read through the Bible. So we should understand that he has kept wisdom for survival in these last days. Not, in the, not only in the instruction of scriptures, but in personalities. So that if you find yourself in Potiphar's wife, you may not have found all the scriptures that say, thou shalt not commit adultery, but the wisdom is personified in who? Joseph. So you just need to crack into Joseph. He has embodied the wisdom. That in the day of adversity, when the, the witness of men is walk away on God, see what he has made out of your life. There is a wisdom that personifies patience, long suffering under pressure. The name is Job. Are you with me? I know many of you want to be anointed. Okay. I love being anointed too. <laughs> but you see, the Bible makes me know that the, with the anointing comes a conflict. And if you are looking for how to survive with the conflict that comes with the anointing, it's been personified in the name of a young girl called Mary. Because it was high favor that made her stomach begin to protrude. So Mary could no longer say, or could no longer say, God has not chosen me. But how do we solve this pregnancy that we need to explain to everybody as a result of the choice of God over my life? That's the conflict of the anointed. And every anointed man, truly anointed man, who stands in his calling will face conflicts. Every one of them will know the way of isolation, except to compromise on your anointing. You will need to know how to endure and carry a baby that indicates your blessing but advertises your conflict for as long as possible until he's born. You just need to study the story of Mary, you will survive. Are you with me? In case, let me not go too far. In case you find yourself very close to the king, and I'm speaking to you now, you may be male, but there's an Esther anointing on you. You will have found in Esther the technologies of manipulating the throne. It's not beauty. It's built into fasting. That's how to manipulate the throne. You will fast. The people who work with you will fast. And then you will tell your brethren to fast. That fasting doesn't take long according to scriptures. Then you approach the king and then you experience unusual favor. That will bring redemption. That wisdom is personified in who? Esther. So, so sometimes, sometimes you may be in prayers. And Lord, how do I go about it? And the only thing God shouts at you is Esther. And bro, you may be thinking it's the name of a wife. No, it's wisdom personified in a personality. 
all of these things I'm sharing are tools that God uses to bring interventions when we are short of time. Because we are. Darkness has matured. Darkness has matured. A gate of dreams has opened to us as a house. And let me, let me warn. A gate of dreams has opened to us as a house. The invitation is to study scriptures. Because the interpretation of your dreams are built into scriptures. And tonight I decree that the access gates of the enemy into your dream life are shot by the blood of Jesus. We forbid manipulations in this season. We forbid manipulations in this season. We forbid manipulations in this season. In the name of Jesus. Along with the open gates, Father, we decree tonight that the spirit that makes for the ease of interpretation is imparted in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. Paul was yearning for a greater dimension of intimacy. Be made conformable unto his death because there was what the death of Jesus achieved in him. And Paul is saying, I want to be altered in existence so that I can fit into the deliveries of your death. Next. If by any means, Paul saw that these three experiences had a product. And the product is to attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So it was a yearning. This is not my verse. I just used this to explain the things I've been saying. My entrance verse or, or scripture is in Luke chapter 24. I'm going to read quickly the first eight verses. I want to share with us briefly on the subject, the five witnesses of his resurrection. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, there came into unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. I want you to follow the story like a movie. Give me back verse 1. I'm going to rush read now. Upon the first day of the week, like this morning, very early in the morning, that's at dawn, they came, so it was not one person, unto the sepulchre, that's the tomb where Jesus was buried. And they came with substances. The Bible called them spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. A peep into the substances that they came with will reveal to you that the major component they carried was called mire. It's a mix of the products of a perfumery and um, also body preservatory um, substances. Who is in anatomy here? Glory, what did you study? Okay, you may not know what. Okay, anatomy. What's the name of that substance that they use to keep dead bodies at least fresh somehow, sir? For for Malin. So that's the blend. It's to give long, it's to slow down the, the, the rate of um, decay and to quench the odor that comes from the body. That's the mire blend. So that you find out that when we were at Christmas, we, we sang songs like We Three Kings of Orient are. Well, the Bible did not give us the number of the kings that came. To Jesus. The Bible just made us know that certain wise men came, but when they congregated all their gifts, the gifts fell into three categories. There was gold as a prophetic symbol because these kings were not normal kings. They were astrologers, masters of the stars. Who could read the star to know the shape of the child that was born? 
And so their gifts were incident upon their perceptions of the child that was born. So the gold was to symbolize his kingship. Frankincense is a tool of priests. So they understood that he was a king and that he was a priest. And that in entering into destiny, he would need to pay a price in death. So they also brought mire. So their gifts were a story that they were telling from their realm of visions as to the life and the times of Jesus the Christ. Is somebody with me? Okay. So, so that's what they brought anyway. So they were in, this journey was in fulfillment of the last gift that was advertised in scriptures, mire, spices. The concept of spices means that what they brought was not a pure substance, it was a blend. Are you with me? Do your own study and then we can, we can do Bible study. Meanwhile, where is my flyer for next week Tuesday? Is he ready? Where is uh, uh, so fly the flyer? I mean, it flies something that flies something. So fly the flyer. Amen. Sorry, I know you want me to be very hard. I, I found out that it's, it, the hardness is not the power. I'm in class. I'm in class. This house will be in flames very soon. I'm in class. And Jesus has given me teachers. And I'm carefully following my teachers. Where's my flyer now? Ah, why is this small like this? Okay, so next week, Tuesday and Thursday, I'm going to be sitting here. Maybe with your Pastor Jola, if you like his face or any of the other pastors, because it was your face they saw the last time. What I'm going to be dealing, this meeting is a twofold meeting. I want to share with fresh men. I know we call them freshers, but they're supposed to be fresh men. That's a more gendered name than freshers. Are you with me? So, if you know any 100 level students or 200 level students, and there are people who are in 500 level who are freshmen. Because the wisdom they have used to go to 100 level, 200 level, 300 level, 400 level is secondary school wisdom. It means they are still fresh but almost graduating. May God give you understanding. So it's basically a question and answer session for freshmen. People who are trying to decode survival not just academically but destiny wise within the framework of a higher institution how can you come with a mandate and survive with a mandate how can you come in in flames focused and survive all the vicissitudes of the campus and still come out in freshness of what you were shown in a more mature form so it's for freshmen and then if you feel that God is calling you onto any kind of ministerial labor, that you have what I call a pioneering anointing. The Lord will want me to share certain things with you. So if you have questions, how do I walk into a door and start a church? How do I fight the serpents that show up? How do I build a team? What do I do to Judas in the day that will become a piece of merchandise that can be sold for 100,000 naira? What do you do to a betrayer? How do you go past the enmity of the brethren and still walk in love but stay focused? These are many things that Jesus will want me to share so that our journeys can be faster. Many of them were learned with scars. So we'll have two full days. The sessions will start at what time? What time is there? So, I'll do five to eight, five to eight, two days. So, we'll have six hours of question and answer. So, you can start compiling your questions. And if you have them, please get them to who is going to coordinate them. Which of the pastors? Or you want to do? Okay, so give to Pastor Diola and uh, Pastor Uri or me. I'm looking for, okay, not there. Good. So, give to both of them.
Okay. So, Minister Dami, is it possible to have a link up before the end of this service? So, you can also, you can create a link that's better so that you send your questions there and then um, they can compile them and then we'll take as many as the Lord will have us take. So, that's that. All right. So, let's go on with our Maya story. All right. Luke chapter 24, verse 2 now. And they found, because if you read other renditions, you find out that this journey was with a conflict in their hearts. They wanted access to the body of Jesus, but in their hearts was the consciousness that a stone that could not be rolled away by feminine energies was at the door of the grave. The Bible said they found and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. Let's read on. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. So hitherto we find out that there were two expectations they had. One was the expectation of an obstacle. The second was the expectation of of a kind of fellowship. Are you with me? Maybe I should just read and just go away because you are looking like, say what you want to say now. All of these things are pathways that God is revealing to us because in the pursuit of the Christ, I need to announce to you that your journey is not one without obstacles. And what the obstacles do is to discourage you from joining at all. What must keep you on the journey in spite of the obstacles is the craving for a fellowship with the Lord. They knew there was a stone there, a stone they could not handle. And what they should have done was sit at home. But they had a flicker of hope, like a small light ray of hope, saying to them that there was a possibility of the shifting of the stone. That was the only reason why they journeyed. You don't put mire on stone. They just believed that their craving was going to produce a fellowship with the physical body of Jesus. But their two expectations were cut short because they saw that the obstacle no longer existed which will have brought joys to their hearts but they also found out that the body was absent. So no fellowship. Next verse. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed. So you saw their challenge. Thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And you find out that these were angels in shining garments. Let's read on. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? The witness of the angels was one to bring them up to speed with God's intentions that sponsored the death of Jesus. Two, it was to bring them up to speed with the current state of their Lord. Three, it was to refocus them in their quest for fellowship. That what you came to offer to him is not necessary because you don't mire or put mire on living beings. We don't apply formalin on human beings, living people, do you? What's the effect? You don't know. Has he touched your hand before? Or used to wear gloves? Okay. That you have a you are a genuine seeker, but the shape of him that you seek is wrong. And that really echoes to us the testimony of Jesus as to the worship of the Samaritans. Say, we the Jews we worship a God that we know. That's in John chapter 4. But do you worship a God that you do not know? It was reiterated in the experience of Paul in Athens when he found out that there was an altar that was built, serviced, an altar that sustained priesthood to a God that was unknown. So my question is, I know you seek him, 
But do you know the one that you seek? Because to them, the one they sought was dead. And the angels are saying, he's living. Mm. Verse 6. He's not here. But he's risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was in Galilee. What did he say? Verse 7. Saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day so this verse is trying to straighten some people's doctrine because some people say that Jesus resurrected when? after three days after three days is day four the witness of scripture is the third day so the day he died is day one because if you put your mind to it and you quote after three days it means the resurrection morning should have been when? Monday the Jewish day closes at 6 p.m. and the Jewish day starts at 6 p.m. According to Genesis chapter 1, evening and morning. That's how they count their days. So, Jesus died at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, Friday. That's day 1. So, by 6 p.m. they had entered day 2, which is what you could call your Saturday. And then by 6 p.m. on Saturday they had entered day 3, his resurrection was at dawn, so they were in, they were on the third day. Are you with me? All right, good. So, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. That's the template of the Passion of the Christ. And the Bible said, they remembered his words. Let me stop there. What the Lord wants me to bring to you, like I said, is titled the five witnesses of his resurrection. It will have been sufficient enough to stay with one witness. But based on Jesus' postulation, that's in Matthew chapter 18, and you can give me from the 14th verse. We want to arrive at Jesus' measurement of that which is true. You find out that when I was laboring the other time, partnering with the Holy Spirit to administer graces, if you listen to my prayer, I learned that prayer from the Apostle Aaron. Now I'm trying to merge two kinds of operations. What I've learned from my spiritual father and what I'm learning from Dr. David Ubuili. So, um, Papa has advertised the reception of a witness from heaven. And when that witness arrives, in trying to bring the graces as advertised by the witness of the Spirit, he asks for mercy from the Spirit to confirm what he showed him. You spoke to me that we anoint a king in our midst. Now, help me find the king that you have chosen and anoint him. He's saying, I have brought a witness to the people. But confirm the witness because of this statement that Jesus made that gave us the measurement, a metric system to establish truth. Now, the context was that Jesus was bringing to his disciples or his hearers and his hearers the intentions of God in redeeming strain or erring brethren. That's the context. So in verse 14 it says even so it is not the will of your father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. It was advertising a God whose ways and acts are redemptive. That's Easter. In verse 15, he now says, Moreover, if thy brother, because in preserving the brethren from strain, we will need to trust God to mend gaps that offenses have created. So he says, If thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained 
restored fellowship with your brother. But if you will not hear, and I thank God that Jesus factored this in because some people, when you talk to them personally, they will not hear. So God knows our frame. Now, sometimes silent rebuke works nothing. So he says, if you will not hear thee, then what should you do? Take with you one or two more that in the mount of two or three witnesses every word may be established so if I come to there and say Jesus is risen to establish that utterance as truth in some translations is rendered truth the truth is established by the mount of two or more witnesses um, we we'll need to look for many more witnesses to establish it and Jesus told me to show you five Four of them within the context of Luke chapter 24, verse 1 to 8. And then we'll now jump to Romans chapter 6 and find the fifth witness. Because the fifth witness is supposed to impact us with a body. Then we go to pray. Is that fine? Who is the first witness that we see here? Our first witness will be the women. The women. The women were first-hand witnesses. If the angels had not appeared to them, they would have still been able to bring perspective to the sightings of the events at the sepulchre. That the stone has been rolled, body disappeared. Their witness would have been earthy. It would have been speculative because people have been wondering where did he go? Did he steal his body? You remember in another account, the women left. The disciples too left. I think that's the John account. And Mary stayed alone. And then she saw a gardener and mistook him for the Christ. Are you with me? So, the women will have sustained a speculative witness. But they were added into a more complete witness by the introduction of a second layer of witnesses called in this portion of scripture two men in shiny garments so these mortals required an angelic backup to be able to establish them as perfect witnesses now they had a good story to tell he is risen Tom Stone wrote away, body gone. They said that he's no longer among the dead. Are you with me? So you saw the first layer, you saw the second layer. By the witness of the women and the angels, it was sufficient enough to prove that Jesus has resurrected. But if you follow the narrative, the angels introduced the women to a third layer of witness, and the third layer of witness was the Lord himself, in that he had borne witness to the shape of the events that would characterize his death. Remember that he told you. And when he told them, it was not the women alone that he told. He told his disciples. So there was something that Jesus said that assures us as a third layer of witness that he resurrected from the dead. The fourth layer of the witnessing will happen when the woman returned back to his disciples. And the disciples, according to verse 8, come to the acknowledgement that he said so. Confirming the utterance. So the angels backing up, perfecting the women's witness. The witness of the angels becoming substantiated by what Jesus said. And the end acknowledgement also showed that the disciples will also be able to testify that yes, yes, truly, truly. Ah, no, toss up he said that he will resurrect. So you have four layers of witness. It means we have even exited the prerequisite for witnessing. But if that is all that the world will have, it means we'll have a problem. Because the market woman may not be able to receive witness from the women because they are no more. The market woman may not be able, may fortunate to receive the witness of the angels. Um, because they may not assign unto that activity. 
It's possible that the women in the market can have scriptures read to them, but they will need more than a witness. And by the time we arrive at scriptures, which is the utterances of the Christ, we have only one witness. Two witnesses can no longer be assessed. Are you with me? It means the truth of his resurrection was not only designed to be established by scripture because it will not meet up with the quorum for witnesses. The fourth layer as advertised here is the confirmation by the disciples that he spoke to them. And I don't know the last time you saw Peter or you saw James, you saw John. It means that the only thing the market woman can build upon is what? The writings and scriptures that Jesus said so. So if you go to the market with a megaphone and say he is risen, if they don't believe you, they have a good ground not to believe you because the lowest quorum, that's the number of required persons to establish or institutionalize your, your stand is two. And it is for that purpose that we need to look for the fifth witness. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. And if you please, you can just give me the first four verses for time's sake. What shall we say then? Maybe I'll read from one to maybe seven or eight. Let's see. If, I think the first verse, four verses should help me, but um, you may want to learn more. So read the whole portion where you get home. What shall we say then? Scripture says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. In newer translations, that, those first two words come with an exclamation. God forbid. Like somebody says, ah, you will lose your shoe. You will scream. God forbid. You can even add. What's the word we add to it? Bad thing. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer daring? Now the concept of being dead to sin was misconstrued a few years ago even in this territory. People mistook being dead to sin with sin is dead. The simple deliverance that one of my brothers got who was still in the hostel, we just blocked on the road and I remember he challenged me around that one five junction. I said, what do you do? I said, I'm the pastor in that church in 40. He said, I've been looking for you. And then began to propound his theory. He said, I've been looking for me because the thing, I, I don't know much about this thing I've been preaching. So, and me, I was an NFA. I woke up that morning. I had no ambition. I had no way I was going. I was just walking around. He carried a portmanteau. You know what they call portmanteau. It's an ancient looking briefcase. And he, he was headed to class. I had no ambition. I was at the mercy of the wind. If you meet the sons of the wind, they don't have ambition. The Bible says the wind blew it where it listed. That was what Elijah was like in the Old Testament. So that in the day that he met with Obadiah, that's the servant of Ahab. He said, I'll be here. Tell the king to meet me. He says, a lie. I know you. If I leave you here, you see, the, the spirit of God will carry you, carry you to another place. And Ahab will say, I lied. It was the same technology that Philip walked with in his evangelistic endeavors. That he could be here and the next time he could be there. That's how the sons of the wind are. We have time for kingdom things. Are you with me? So when he now finished and I said, ah, you live in the hostel? He said, yes. Are there Yahoo boys or Yahoo girls in your hostel? I said, they are there. So I said, how is sin dead? Maybe it doesn't have power over you. But their own life still express it. I've, been, I've taught you, I have a sermon like that. I, I, don't, I, I know I didn't call it the three P's of sin, but I taught you the presence, the power of sin, that that's what was broken on the cross, right? The presence of sin is what Jesus is dealing with now. And then the, no, sorry, the principle of sin has been dealt with. The power of sin 
is being dealt with. The presence of sin will be dealt with. So the principle of sin is built around the soul that sinned shall die. Are you with me? So once you touch sin, death is activated. Jesus has closed that principle because he came by. In the day you eat of the fruit of this tree, you will die. But Satan is still trying to flex. And that has to do with activity. Temptations, all of that. That's how sin is being powered. But a time will come when Jesus has returned that this world, the new world, which is the new heaven and the new earth, will no longer give admittance to sin. So that's when the presence of sin will be dealt with. Are you with me? Good. How did we get to that? So that my brother, the guy now saw that I caught him red-handed. He now said, I have class. He said, what? Oh, to bed. <laughs> I gave him a chair, a bench at one five junction. That, two of us don't have time. I now lured him into the consciousness that were you saved before you started listening to these things that have almost ruined your, your, your safe state? Because the young man could no, no longer perceive fellowship with God. He had begun to put his hands into iniquity, but he no longer felt anything. Because he had been told that confessing your sins was anti the realms of grace. That you needed to live as a liar. That I, I, don't, I don't commit sin. Even if you sin, so God, I don't owe you anything. That you are forgiving my sins, past, present, future. And that there's a deficit of forgiveness that you need to sin into so that you can possess it. <laughs> you know what that means. If Jesus paid for ice cream yesterday, today, and one ice cream per day for the next 10 years, it will be wrong for you to wake up tomorrow and not want ice cream. Are you with me? Because if you don't get ice cream tomorrow, it means you wasted the payment for tomorrow. So if Jesus has paid for all of your sins into the future, it means if you wake up tomorrow and you don't sin, you wasted the payment for tomorrow. You have to keep sinning to meet up with it. So if you do anything wrong, you don't owe him anything. You just press withdraw. And then the withdrawal solves that day and you continue. If you live that way for six months, the Holy Spirit will have been quenched or grieved into silence. When you sin now, you no longer be able to come into the grief, which is what the Bible calls godly sorrow that worketh repentance. You will not feel anything again. You just be turning on. That's how people go apostate. Unfortunately, in scriptures, we do not know how much you can live like that or how long you can live like that before you are, you are given to a reprobate mind. Well, the young, we ended in arguments, so I left him in the hands of Jesus. I hope he has been recovered. Many people propounded those theories have found Jesus again. So we're happy. We're happy. Anyways, that was my encounter with the young man. So, the Bible says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin? So, sin still ravages those who have not subscribed to the death of Christ. But we have been given immunity against it. Jesus became sin. When he was nailed on the cross, we were nailed in him. And so when he died, we also died. It's on that ground that sin loses its dominion. But the Bible says it's possible for a man who is dead to sin to still live there, there. It means there are reactivations that can happen by subscription. That's three. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized, fully immersed, that's the mystery of inclusion, into Christ, were baptized into his death. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should work in the newness of life. And this is the mandate of the fifth witness. That if the only thing that remains public in public viewing um, as a witness unto the resurrection of Jesus is what is written in scriptures. If the only thing I can do as a pastor is to read to you 
what Jesus said or you can do as maybe an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist or a brother, a believer is that you can say Jesus is risen, you will be wrong. We need a second witness. And the second witness as the fifth witness is a company of men who walk in the newness of life. Because our walk in the newness of life is proof that truly Jesus resurrected from the dead. What Jesus told me to do is to place a demand upon you to say to you that there are five witnesses but there are only two currently in public view and every time you choose not to walk in the newness of life you make light of the testimony that Jesus has resurrected so Easter this year brings a burden on our shoulders a burden that this resurrection event and the implications thereof require another witness in the classroom require another witness on the street they may not see an angel they may not have any cognitive fellowship with Mary or with the disciples of Jesus but they have your utterances and there's also the privilege of experiencing your life if your life is not expressed in newness then you have reduced the witnesses to one and based on the utterances of Jesus they can say that the resurrection is a lie you know that if you were a tout or maybe what else maybe you were a thief you are an adulterer you were a liar when you meet with Jesus and people see your life begin to operate in another direction after a while they will ask you what happened and if you tell, told them I'm new because Jesus resurrected you see, they may not understand the mystery of his resurrection, but they will not also be able to say you are not new. Are you with me? It's a short charge. I just went round to get it to you. What he wants us to do is to now make a commitment. In the older churches, the orthodox churches, immediately after the sermon, the prayer is not closing prayer the prayer is always a prayer of commitment based on what I've heard I'll be responsible I know there's no school tomorrow but there'll be school on Tuesday and Jesus is saying when you arrive in class on Tuesday beyond we celebrated this time Jesus rose on Sunday people want to see a life a life that is distinctively different from the life of a non-believer. A life that did not proceed because of accurate home training. You know if I slap you, home training might make you endure a little. I, I, the first time I heard this home training thing was Lawrence. Evangelist Lawrence Oyo that was sharing it many years ago. If I slap you, in your heart you can grumble but you can give me that one. Home training cannot take 10 slaps. Oh, by the seventh slap, you say, Kai, Kai. It, honestly, if you, if you try it again. I, I was sharing with my wife an experience I had. Traveled late. During the week, I was in worry before this government meeting. I was trying to catch a flight in Lagos and I decided to take a bus. A bus, yes. Got myself a very comfortable seat and then the driver started driving like it was mountain driving. Woo, woo, woo. And then a young lady behind said, ah, Baba, Baba, you know, in Yoruba, this way you are driving. Ah, be careful. Is how you talk to your mother at home. And I'm trying to vary, you are driving badly with mother at home. An elderly woman spoke too. So people don't even respect their husbands. Oh God, what kind of, so in my heart oh, but you see, those journeys are prayer and meditation journeys for me. So I left the guy until we almost got to a job. And then a trailer suddenly swerved because of a portal. And the man continued straight. When people shouted, he said the trailer trafficated late. The trailer was still going diagonally and he was trying to claim with a trailer. So... I now felt that I could help the discourse. So I now joined my mouth to it to say, Baba, 
and you have been trying since, but you are not driving well now. He said, is that how you talk to your father at home? <laughs> now, that thing drove an arrow into my heart. And I know by the mercy of God that I sustain some dimension of potency. That disobedience can be punished instantly. So I tried to. Oh, 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 oh. Many things were moving in my heart. But I was restrained. Unfortunately, I saw that Satan wanted to destroy my witness. Because the man was intentional about him. Look at him. All these young, young boys. He paid for two seats. Am I supposed to squeeze as four? How? We are not going to live for a thousand years. So if you can sit well, sit well. Ah. At least I, I, I didn't chatter a Rolls Royce story, but I entered a bus. And to some people, that's criminal for me. They say that I don't understand ministry ethics. Why so I should be sitting in the bus? For me, anything that moves and gets me to destination is a vehicle. I said, that man spoke for like three kilometers. You know, when Yoruba said they are sending you home, it was going back and forth, back and forth. Ah! The thing now got to my head. I now said, Baba. He kept quiet to hear me. I said, may you not hurt somebody. Who will, who by offense will convert your journeys to be from mountain to mountain? Because there are people like that. I spoke because I sensed that even God was angry. And you see, people of, a people of sacrifice by the mercy of God have defense systems. If you trouble that defense system long enough, the redemption they can bring to you is that they say something. And if they say that thing, God will now say, okay, you want to fight your battle? Okay, I free you. But if they keep quiet, you complicate issues because God will now fight as God. The man has said, do I know who his parents are? <gasps> Nicodemus, you don't understand the mysteries of the kingdom. So I kept quiet. The guy spoke till we got to a battle. But me had given him a possibility if it continues like that. I can be one mountain to one mountain. And I'm not a public minister. So if they tell you on the mountain to go and beg the person, you will not find me for a long time. You can't endure insults for two kilometers with home training. You will have said your, your own father too. Ah. Home training, home training. Home training is good. You know, people will even tell you that with home training. How can somebody abuse your father and you are quiet? You should give him hot, hot. What keeps you back is the spirit of your witness. That's the Holy Ghost. It takes you beyond the realms of home training. After a while, you begin to pity the man. Say, ah. It should have a life, Papa. Just, uh, yeah. So you are thinking of what Satan is doing and not what the man is doing. So when people look at your ability to take in quotes nonsense from people, they are wondering how did you become like that? And your testimony will be I am raised together with Christ. There is a demand for a people who will be the fifth witness. And I want to spend time to pray for about four minutes to say, Lord, I yield to the helps of your spirit. Make me another layer of witness. Let my life be a testimony to your resurrection. Let my life be a testimony to your resurrection. That in a day that Mary and her sisters could no longer be seen, in a day that men can no longer encounter angels to receive witness of them in the seasons that we are left with just the writings of scriptures may my life be a second line of validation I arise as the fifth witness to your resurrection I arise I arise is somebody praying tonight I arise I arise 
if there are things to trim out, if there are things to literally cut off, if there are entrances into which I need to be pressed, whatever needs to be torn to see me established as a witness, Lord, do it to me. 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 Siko bifekino kia kato Sokariato bekukala Tabako bedi kabekwan kafiato Sobie kefredo kasite Kai sombri Kakapevri ankonva Salite kapoa That we begin from when we walk out of these doors That the landscape of our city Obama saw will be littered With witnesses Bringing a live testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. Men and women consciously working in the newness of life. Let the areas areas of conflict in our lives be solved oh, as an instrument of righteousness help me choir I yield myself you, you can have all that I, I yield myself I yield myself as a be retained we trust you you have been faithful in generations past and in us you will find us thank you father let there be known in our company that lives a life in betrayal and in secret and in the open that before men and before principalities and powers 
our establishment in the newness of life may be glaring for all to see. Blessed be your matchless name. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen.